you laugh. It's like my head of communications. He sends me a text before everything. Oh, I'm doing it make too. sure to smile. I'm doing it too. Yeah. I've gotten that advice from other people too. You get really thoughtful <laughs> and then you get in your head. How long are you here? I leave in tonight. Oh, damn. I have to be in New York tomorrow. You got an early meeting tomorrow in New York? Of course. That was funny. Right here in the Twitter. In the Twitter sphere. Exactly. Yeah, we are so savvy. All right, so guys, if you had friends that were supposed to be here but couldn't make it, apparently we're going to be live streamed. So there we go. We can share. I don't know how you, I think, Robbie, what did you say? It was, and, um, I mean, sorry, not Robbie. Uh, Ryan, the, uh, if we wanted to tell the audience, if they wanted to share it with their friends, how do they find it? Uh, YouTube, Austin Tech Live channel. So just search Austin Tech Live. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm busy telling the Twitterverse about our panel, so just hold one moment, please. <laughs> this is that bad use of uh, remote technology versus in present. Um, thank you guys for being here. We, um, you, know, you never know at South By what the size of a crowd is going to be. Uh, we've gone to things where you know, you're, you're locked out when you got there an hour early, um, and here you guys are here early and we've got some more space. So thank you for making the effort on a cloudy Monday morning. Um, I, was, I was tweeting this morning and letting people know about this, and I was like, you know, I'm doing this panel, and then I'm doing a discussion later today about um, the future of technology and social good. I'm like, I'm equally passionate about both topics, right? They are interwoven, um, and uh, I'm really excited I get to have a conversation with you guys and learn more. Uh, I'm Nancy Giordano. I describe my work as a strategic futurist. Um, uh, which basically means I am here to ensure a safe and thriving future uh, that's as inclusive as possible. I'm uh, also described as endlessly optimistic because I do believe that technology plays a really big role in being able to make that happen. And I help organizations and audiences and executives answer basically two questions, which is what does the future need and expect of us? And then what are we each in a unique position to create and contribute to that future? So that's really the framing as I think through this, which is, gosh, there's all kinds of stuff that is being you know, uh, more and more visible about how these technologies are going to impact things and there's something that we can each do to make that more successful, more, um, uh, something we're really proud that we brought to the world as opposed to something that we have to worry about later down the road. Um, so with that, I've uh, got two extraordinary panelists. Unfortunately, we did lose one of our panelists. Uh, there's uh, something going on back at the office that he could not get out of. So uh, Carl sends his apologies for not being able to be with us. And, uh, but we do have his insights because I spent time chatting with him prior to the panel. So we'll weave some of Carl's thinking in uh, virtually. And Carl, if you're watching via live stream, um, uh, but Robbie, uh, you know, just sort of the, the quick uh, hit on you, and then I'll give you guys a chance to introduce yourselves more formally. But um, I find that y'all don't brag about yourselves when you introduce yourself. So I will do the bragging, and you can do the filling in. Uh, but Robbie, CEO of a company called Infinia Machine Learning, uh, has authored or co authored eight books on the topic, has six patents and has another book coming out next year or end of this year? This year, year. This I year. Hope. Yeah. Uh, Machine Learning in Practice. Mm -hmm. Right? So I can imagine a better prepared person for this conversation, because that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about, if not the center of the conversation today. Um, and Ron is, has co-founded nine companies or uh, startups. Um, currently is co-founder and CTO for um, a, an artificial intelligence services company called Kung Fu AI right here in Austin, yep. and uh, is a UT grad and uh, has a degree from, also from the University of Sussex, but I, I, I love the title of it, which is Evolutionary and Adaptive Systems. I'm like, yes. yes. Right? yes. A, who knew you could get a degree in that? And B, that's exactly the name of the game that we're all in right now, is yep. understanding evolutionary and adaptive systems and the role that technology plays in that. Um, so do you guys want to give any more intro into what Infinia does and what makes you passionate as you smile and tell us all about it. Yes, we... no, so Infinia ML is a, a team of machine learning experts. Uh, we spun out, out of Duke's machine learning lab 
Dr. Larry Cairns, our chief scientist, he happens to be one of the luminaries in the machine learning research world. Um, he's, you know, last year at NIPS, he published 10 papers. NIPS is the preeminent uh, machine learning academic conference. He was the most published person there. Um, anyway, lots of uh, organizations were coming to him um, at his machine learning lab at Duke asking for help implementing machine learning. He thought now would be a good time to, to start a company around that, so um, that's how InfiniML got started. Uh, now we're up to you know, roughly 40 people. We have uh, nine PhDs on staff, uh, really a team of elite level data scientists um, that understand both the theory and the application of machine learning. And so what we do are, is help companies um, understand and create a strategy around machine learning, then tackle you know, core problems um, that can be automated with machine learning, and then ultimately help them get it imp implemented into production. And this will be something that I think we'll, we'll touch on quite a bit. And it's that last piece that I think has been um, not really given a ton of press. All you hear about are the headlines for the most part. Um, you know, you, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, even they're covering all these what seem like very interesting applications of machine learning, but in general, most of those are still in kind of the research phase. You know, they're just now starting to see some of these applications make it into uh, production environments in, in the enterprise. Um, and so we're just kind of at that inflection point, and InfiniML is really kind of helping companies uh, go from strategy all the way to, uh, you know, helping solve core problems with machine learning in production. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> and uh, I'm Ron Green. As Nancy said, I'm with uh, Kung Fu AI. Um, very similar, we're an AI professional services company. We're really helping companies um, take their first steps into AI, whether that means strategy, uh, trying to figure out um, really what the art of the possible is right now, because things are, things are moving pretty quickly, and, and very often we find that uh, companies aren't even sure um, where they can take that first step because it's a little intimidating. And so we help with strategy all the way through implementation. And uh, you know, you kind of touched on this and hopefully we'll talk about this a little bit more, but there are, there are some really nuances to deploying AI into, the, into production and maintaining that. And I'd like to make sure that's something we, we talk about today. It's really interesting. And that's, I think, one of the areas that we uh, help companies with the most. And what we're realizing is in some ways, um, I don't know if stumbling block's the right word, but part of the uh, uh, slowing down the progress Right, of being able to bring these solutions in because they recognize or aren't prepared for or need to figure out how all the parts fit together. So it's a really critical part right. of being able to make this future possible. Um, before we start on the really the, the big questions, I think it always helps to start with a story. So I'm curious to know uh, if you can share with us, you know, just a quick little case study, you know, very quickly, uh, where uh, an, a practical uh, or pragmatic AI or machine learning solution has somehow brought something to an enterprise that just was like, it's such an easy story, but such a great story to tell uh, about what's possible. So the one I'd probably start with is with the government. And so wow. we, um, <clears throat> this actually originated with some of uh, our chief scientists work at Duke and now Infinia's um, kind of moving it forward. And that's something that actually everybody in this room, I would imagine, has had experience with, and that's walking through the security line at the airport. Um, so we're all familiar with the TSA agents that are looking at these screens um, of your bags going through the x-ray machines. Um, you know, studies have shown that they're not catching everything, right? They're looking for knives, guns, explosives, other things, your bottle of water. And uh, they, don't, they don't catch everything. And in fact, you know, to me, this is such a great example because um, you know, there's also lots of talk, not, not to mention the headlines I spoke of earlier, but just, you know, AI is coming for our jobs, right? And what's going to happen to the workforce? Um, I, I would suggest anytime you hear somebody, you know, really kind of getting frothy about that topic, to first think about the, the job that's being displaced. Should that have ever been done by a person in the first place, right? So I, I think a lot of times, and and when I give this talk, sometimes I have this slide of, you know, just to show my age, if you remember, I Love Lucy, when she was at the chocolate factory and all the chocolates are going by and like she's like can't keep up and like she's throwing the chocolates in her mouth. It's just an example, like people should not be doing those types of activities, right? But, so why do we have them do that? Is it because we didn't have a technology option in the past? Well, now thanks to machine learning, we're starting to get some technology options to automate jobs that should have never been done by a person. Right, and so I would you know, go back to the TSA example. You have humans looking at these uh, screens you know, constantly, all day, hours and hours, trying to detect you know, minute differences or little things that may indicate that there's a knife or a gun 
uh, going through a bag. That is not the best use of humans' talents, right? And so now, thanks to machine learning, um, especially when it comes to object detection, that's an ideal use case for um, technology. And so what we've been working with the TSA on is actually implementing machine learning and um, object detection within the X-ray scanners and working with the, the OEMs to automatically detect knives and guns. Turns out explosives are a little bit harder, it requires some changes to the underlying um, X-ray technology. But as far as knives and guns, we're already at human level performance. Um, and in fact, they're going to be rolling this technology out to every airport in the United States over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and so what that will mean is, it, you know, not only is it helping replace something um, that should have never been done by a person, it actually should make things more secure, right? We'll be able to detect and catch things at a higher rate than what, what people can do by themselves. The other piece to this that I, I would mention is it, it's almost never the case that it's 100% automation, right? So what won't happen or what you won't see when you go to the airports is just, you know, a robot standing there telling you to go, go by or not, right? What's going to happen is it'll be the technology working with people to make them more efficient at their job. So the technology will be the first line of defense to kind of indicate, is there something to look into more here? And then that's when a person can step in and, and check it out. Um, but again, what that means is we can actually get people through this, the lines faster um, and require less of people and have them be kind of the, the, the last check to say, all right, we found something, double check this, you know, and actually have a person get into the, into the process at that point. Um, so anyway, this is, and I think, a good one. That's a great story. And um, when we circle back and talk about how we get the you know, organizations aligned and the implications of it, that is a great one. TSA <laughs> will have a lot to share about what is possible because I think that's where we imagine tremendous solutions, right, from end to end to make a customer's journey more successful or a patient's journey um, certainly more empathetic and more... Um, smooth and more fluid, and yet there's all these steps in the way that often you know, roadblock us. And so the fact that you were able to get that through and implement it in a reasonable amount of time, uh, we can't wait to hear more. Uh, what's another inspiring story? Um, well, real fast before I, before I answer, uh, real show of hands, how many people here are working uh, in a company that's either looking at doing AI or working with AI right now? Okay, quite a few. Okay, that's great. So, um, okay, I think my favorite story around AI that happened last year uh, at Kung Fu AI was with a company, uh, Keller Williams, a uh, large global real estate company. And we did a computer vision project to um, pull in data from decades, decades worth of documents. And I think this is, I think this is uh, an application that would be applicable to almost any company in America. They had uh, hundreds of thousands of documents, PDFs, scanned images, sitting on hard drives for decades, had no idea how to unlock the data. Um, and we built a, a complete computer vision system to grab these documents, extract from each of the individual pages a myriad of different um, fields, um, and pull those into a database and feed them into machine learning algorithms. And it's interesting for a couple reasons. One is, it's, it's really complicated because the documents change over time. There could be typing, there could be handwriting. Um, and what we, were what we were really pleased about was the computer vision approach um, really shocked us with its accuracy. This is, this is how far things have come. Uh, we had trained it on a giant set of documents of one type and accidentally fed in some of another type, and it handled it completely fine. It literally was able to find fields, for example, within these real estate contracts like earnest money. Normally it's on page two, it appeared on page 11, completely different context, it found it, identified it. And the reason it was able to do that is uh, the type of computer vision approach that we were taking was looking at all of the, the surrounding context Right? It, wasn't, it wasn't solving it in a simple way, it was solving it very much the way a human would, by looking at the visual context. And this allowed them to do a couple things. One, it allowed them to unlock data in a, an efficient way, right? It, humans didn't have to go through and spend hundreds of hours, thousands of hours. Um, but more importantly, all of that information, this decade's worth of real estate um, transaction information, was unlocked, and now they're able to use those on really, really sophisticated uh, machine learning models within the company to help them make better predictions. Can you give one prediction? Like, what is that? Because it, so, it sounds so exciting from a technological perspective, but the outcome of that, because you talk so much again about outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Uh, one example that I think is really fascinating is that um, if you make an offer on a house and that offer is not accepted, that offer just kind of never existed um, in, in a sense, right? Um, the document may have been emailed to somebody, looked at, and then rejected, um, but there's information there because that offer wasn't accepted either because the, the, the bid was too low or timing issues or some ancillary requirements. Well, all of that information is now captured. And so they're able to not only understand what house is sold and for what price, but what houses didn't sell and why, and use that as, as a, um, a huge set of data into their auto valuation model, their new auto, um, essentially their uh, house auto valuation model that they're developing to automatically predict the house prices. Wow, so I can make my life and my house buying smoother, or is it gonna make you, them more? You, 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 will, you will literally be able to sell your house later this year um, by clicking a button. Wow. Yeah. So again, what's interesting about that, right, is because Keller Williams is also, quote unquote, competing with, um, I forgot the names of the other, it's not Redfin. But uh, Redfin. Like Zillow. There's a, but there's a lot of these online. Yeah, a lot like, of them. That, lot that, of that them. reduce commissions. That's right. And you know, make it door. seem it's so easy to be able to go do it. That's and right. the fact that they're right in the game and not waiting to be disrupted by that. They're That's right. Driving what, it. Yeah, and you know, I think there's, there's a misconception out there. A lot of people talk about, you know, data being the, the oil, the gold of AI, which is totally true. Um, and then thinking that, you know, only the Amazons or the Googles have any data or that they have all the data. That's not true at all. This is a perfect example of where um, uh, most enterprises, if not all enterprises, are going to have some proprietary data that's, that's gold. It just has to be unlocked. Um, and I think, again, when you start to look at the really big implications, for those of us who are in Austin who remember the, the controversy with the ride-sharing companies and trying to figure out how we do uh, safety checks and background checks, you know, one of the big challenges is that every state, every city, every municipality has a totally different way of capturing any kind of uh, arrest record. Right? So as right. much as we think that we're being safe and we look at certain things in a certain discrete context, uh, we often aren't seeing all of it. And the fact that we would be able to use this kind of technology to be able to standardize that information across all these different inputs um, creates a much, much better, safer net around the whole thing. Yeah. So there's wonderful implications. Um, before I ask you the next story, you, know, you guys are mentioning various types of technologies. I don't know how familiar you guys all are with them, but when we start talking about you know, AI for enterprise or practical AI or kind of wrapping our arms around a way of thinking about AI that isn't so broad, um, there are certain kind of techniques that you guys often reference, right? You were talking about object detection, computer vision, um, some more of the other ones that you guys are using regularly to solve day-to-day -day problems. Um, I would say, you know, at, at a high level, um, the main techniques in AI right now kind of fall into two categories, supervised versus unsupervised, and supervised is, uh, by and large, the dominant technique, and that's, that's a, a range of approaches, everything from computer vision, natural language processing, uh, uh, data science, and the way I encourage people to think about it is, um, uh, supervised learning is a way to teach uh, computers to do things when you are not sure exactly how to do them yourself. And it may be because uh, it could be something like identifying, a, a great example is, uh, uh, let's stick with computer vision. If um, you're trying to identify objects within a picture, um, if you were trying to write out the steps for an algorithm, to identify cats versus dogs, it would be extremely difficult. We, we actually aren't really sure how we do it. We can't introspect on our own mental process. Um, so the techniques that um, are moving the field forward right now are literally um, supervised learning, where you, you show an algorithm, a picture of a cat, and it makes a prediction, and if it's right, you, you keep on moving. If it's wrong, you tell it it's wrong and it corrects itself. And that's the idea is that it's learning from examples because we don't know exactly how it should do the process, how it should um, do the calculations. And so that's the dominant technique in it. And you'll see that in everything from computer vision, which can be classification or detection, uh, natural language processing, which you can do things like uh, text summarization or sentiment analysis. You could classify um, spam or classified comments as uh, inappropriate or toxic. Um, you can even generate uh, content. And then I think there's, all, there's a whole other class of algorithms around generative techniques, the ability to actually generate uh, photorealistic faces or generate uh, a, a data from distributions that are imbalanced. Um, and this, that whole area is, I think, super exciting as well. Awesome. Um, you talk a lot about them in your 
uh, description about the work that you do, right? We talk about recommendation engine, 3D image modeling, anomaly detection. I mean, these are things that just feel so concrete mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of the big world of, you know, general AI and whether or not it can, you know, read my dreams at night and tell me what I should be thinking or feeling the next day. Um, so in this world of um, actual application, uh, can you share a story in which something maybe didn't go right and you learned something really valuable, particularly uh, focused on organizational change and transformation? Well, I can, you know, just to go back to the TSA example, this was kind of a a good case where you can also get yourself in trouble um, if you don't know kind of the underpinnings of um, how some of these techniques work. So for example, one of the, the situations that uh, we encountered early on is the, the client came back to us and said, all right, we figured this out. We actually don't need you. We, we, we've you know, got um, a technique in place that's right 100% of the time. And we're like 100% of the time. So just so you know, machine learning is probabilistic. That is, it's not right 100% of the time. It's, it's a probability, right? Um, and so just by, its, by definition, you're not going to get to 100%, right? Just like humans, you know, you're not going to be able to, to necessarily count on having a 100% solution uh, to every problem. Uh, it's the same way with machine learning. They came back and said, we got 100%. Every time we put a knife in a bag, it can detect it. And we said, all right, well, let's, let's see what you got. And so uh, they showed us, they said, all right, we have all these bags and we will send them through. They don't have anything in them and it doesn't, it, it says there's nothing in them. Then we, we take this brown bag and we put the knife in the brown bag. We send it through and we train it to say, you know, all right, there's a knife in this bag, um, you know, and, and we do that over a number of steps. And so now let's run a test, a bunch of bags through, didn't detect the knife. We'll put the knife in the brown bag, send it through, detected the knife. And they said, every time we put the knife in the brown bag, it detects that there's a knife in there. <laughs> and what we said, you did, what you created was an amazing brown bag detector, <laughs> right, exactly. right? You actually didn't create <laughs> a knife detector. In the bag, probably. Yeah, it's like uh, put, you know, just have an empty brown bag and send it through. Ah, it found <laughs> the, the knife. And so that's just an example where you have to be a little careful. Um, and, you know, it is a little bit of... Um, you know, I won't say the Wild West, but it's the type of thing where people can convince themselves that they've done something when they really haven't. And this is, I think, actually can be dangerous, right? This yeah. can be something where, again, you can go into the wild because, again, you don't know actually exactly what's going on behind the scenes um, in terms of the algorithm and how it's making its decisions. And that's a whole other topic we can get into. Um, and so you, you kind of have to just make sure that you've done adequate testing in QA uh, to ensure that what you're sending out in the real world actually is accomplishing what you, your objective was. Well, and this goes back to this whole, you know, we, um uh, I did a career fair for the future yesterday for college and high school students, and we had multiple panels of extraordinary innovators, but this idea of critical thinking, right, come through in the sense of really being able to frame a problem and being able to understand it, because we're still humans that are building whatever the technological solution is, and being able to have a really good sense of how wide to scope that problem or how specific, to, you know, and the biases that go into um, that, whether it's that I only look at brown bags or that I only look at, you know, sort of part, portion of the possibilities has got to be an extraordinary part of being able to take these technologies. I mean, it's high stakes when you're at TSA looking for knives, yeah. right? It is high stakes when you think about safety records or, uh, you know, across the country or across the world. So um, <coughs> in terms of being able to, I guess what the, the question is when you are working with organizations and we think about the strategic side of it as well as the transformation side of it, how do we get better at being able to frame the, the problem? Well, you have to kind of understand what are good problems for machine learning, right? And so, um, you know, one of the things that we say over and over again is it all starts with data, right? You have to have good data in order to, to solve a machine learning problem. And if you don't have the data, then it's kind of a, a you know, you'll, 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 you know, find roadblocks really quickly. And in fact, it, it is a, a lot like garbage in, garbage out in terms of the types of predictions um, that your algorithms may make if it's trained on bad data. And so you have to start with good data, and that oftentimes, you know, I would say, um, you know, I, it's hard to know the exact percentages, anywhere from 60 to 75 percent of trying to create a machine learning based solution is really, it's not the, the sort of brainy work of figuring out what's the right algorithm and, and tuning it correctly and all of that. It's really just getting the data in a situation that can be useful and cleaned and then used in an ongoing manner once you actually are ready to roll it out. And so data is super important um, you know, when it comes to machine learning. And then the other one is just having a problem that is um, not super sensitive to error, right? So again, like I said, machine learning is probabilistic. If you need a 100% solution, machine learning is generally not gonna be the right place to go. Yeah. Because it's, you're not gonna get 
something that produces you know, completely 100% accurate results. Now, again, there's ways to counteract that if you have humans in the loop or there's you know, other ways to kind of uh, circumvent that. The one example that I'll give is with text generation. So my previous company, Automated Insights, um, produced a natural language generation platform. That's kind of a fancy word for taking data and producing text automatically. So imagine, you know, we kind of originally started with um, automating sports uh, recaps. So you take a box score from a sporting event, you automatically generate the recap that summarized the, the, the sporting event. Um, you know, we were doing that back in 2010. The, the challenge that I found with that is, and you, we actually couldn't apply, apply machine learning to it, it had to be more of a rules-based system because when you're generating text, humans are finely tuned to any sort of errors or problems that may come out in sentences, right? So we ultimately started working with the Associated Press, and what I couldn't do is go to the Associated Press and say, you know, one out of ten articles that we give you is going to sound garbled, right? Or the sentences are going to be a little out of whack. Um, is that okay? And they'd be, no, it's not okay. It's got to be pr pristine every single time. And so, therefore, we couldn't actually use machine learning for most of the text generation. And it's still the case today that that's, you can't really use it for text generation, part, partly because you have to have a 100% solution, okay. right? And so in other things like the, you know, the object detection use case I was mentioning before, you know, we were replacing a, a situation where it was known that we weren't, you know, the humans weren't providing a 100% accurate solution. And so there the bar's a little bit lower. Right. And so if you can come in and at least produce a human level performance, that's great. And even above that would be awesome. Right. Ron, you wanna jump in? <coughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I think the, uh, uh, the, Maybe the biggest negative we've seen is that some companies um, are are struggling on the data side, right? Um, um, uh, I think really the only failure we've had uh, as a company is we were working with, with a company that was very very eager and, and um, um, ready to go, very excited about moving into the AI, and then they they just didn't have the data. Um, and what we, what we told them was, you know, the, the good news, bad news. The bad news is you're not ready. The good news is you know now, right? And you can start collecting the data. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that enterprises can do in the short term is do an analysis um, way ahead of time, as early as you possibly can, upstream um, a deployment to make sure that you are collecting the data. Um, and we, we actually found, in this instance, not, they, they actually were collecting the data, but then they were, they were purging it like six months later. And they, it was like just, you know, uh -huh. th throwing away gold. Um, th the other thing that I think is really, really interesting that's going on that a lot of organizations are not anticipating is that when you deploy machine learning, when you deploy AI into the real world, um, you are, um, like Ravi said, it's this, it's this probabilistic model, right? It's not, it's not like deploying regular software where you put it into production, you try to drive out as many bugs as you can, and then it will operate at some level, level of fidelity um, and perpetuity. Um, these models are trained on examples, and they're, if they're trained well, they will generalize well, but if your training set doesn't match the real world or it doesn't match the data that it's gonna be receiving in the real world, or if that data morphs, Right, there can be a there can be an arms race nature to this, a feedback loop to it. Those models can actually decay; they can they can become stale. And it's really really critical if you are deploying machine learning AI solutions into the enterprise that are making predictions that you at least have some type of human in loop in that process, right? Because these models um, will have very often are trying to have some level of of um, probabilistic certainty with them. Some uh, error margins, but you can't take that at face value if the if the data set changes fundamentally from how it was trained. And so w you must have you must have as a part of your DevOps is what we're calling AI DevOps, which is human in the loop, and you must monitor them, treat these much more like like uh, like living uh, creatures than fixed uh, form software. So then just to take the leap then to organizational transformation or, or how org structures will change, right? Mm -hmm. Is it a mindset thing? Like I just know we always talk about uh, you know, adaptivity or, or flexibility or agility or all these words about the fact that as you're trying something new or you're deploying something um, in a certain way, you have to be able to be flexible. I've actually built into contracts with clients, right? That this moment we're going to assess and potentially will pivot so they don't think that we're somehow failing because we don't know the seven steps that come after this. Like we've literally had to put that in there so that they are, you know, 
trained to think about the fact that we can make changes along the way. But when you talk about AI or machine learning, it feels so precise. Right. Like it feels like I should know and it will do exactly what it's supposed to do. So talk to us about like the mindset part of being able to even just look at data. We'll look at the other parts too. But um, uh, are, are people prepared for the fact that it is probabilistic? Um, I find that so, I find some are and some aren't. Uh, I think most are. Most are. Um, most companies uh, seem to have a sense that things are changing and they understand that the state of the art's moving quickly. We run into a few every now and then who want um, want a commitment up front that something's going to work. And like Rob said, given the probabilistic nature of these models, that's not something we can do. Um, so. I think one of the big changes organizationally that companies are going to see, just like the just like the shift with the internet and how that was just sort of baked into every company's uh, operations, you're going to see a little bit more of a collaborative process anywhere AI is being rolled out, whether it's internally or into a product that's going to go externally. And the reason is that. Um, unlike traditional software development where you may have some technical challenges but you fundamentally know you can achieve some end goal with AI machine learning projects, that, that's open-ended question going into it. You may not have the data, you may not have the skill, you may, um, there, there may be enough ambiguity in the problem set itself that it can't be solved with enough accuracy to remove a human loop. So I think collaboration and a collaborative process and the recognition that there's going to be this early sort of research prototyping phase as a part of AI rollout is, is something that's going to really deeply affect organizations in the future. And that research prototyping, we talk a lot about how we can build things that constrain risk, right? So we can do something, but there's a way to do it in a way that we can constrain it so that we can learn more about it, we can certainly learn it faster, and we can take more risk. Right. Um, Rob, you were anxious to do Yeah, that. no, I got, so to me, there's two big gotchas, you know, over the last year and a half since we've, uh, you know, been going with Infinia that we've seen. Um, the first is with data, and this wasn't something you know that was surprising to me because with my last company it was the same thing. And it's that most companies think their data is better than it is, and so when they we come in and say, "All right, we're ready to solve this problem," they and do you have the data? Yeah, we have the data. Yeah, it might need a little cleaning, but it's probably good. Um, you know, the the level of sort of data readiness that's necessary um, for machine learning is typically much higher than what a company thinks of their data, right? And so. Generally, um, you know, there's a fair amount of, of work that has to go on with the data to get it to a point. Um, and just to, to echo what Ron said, I, I think that the big data era had to precede the machine learning era. So we, we are much further along than we were, say, you know, 10 years ago as it, com as it relates to companies being ready to do these sort of data intensive projects. But we're still very early, right? We're, we wouldn't even really be able to do any of the machine learning projects we're doing now had we not started talking about things like big data and, and things like that, uh, you know, back in the 2005, 6, 7 time frame. But again, we're just now really kind of getting to a point where these companies are starting to understand. They've heard these concepts, you know, they, they started to do some things, but it's going to require uh, still more work. The other big gotcha is that, and you know, this is something that it's hard for me to even really talk about with a lot of companies because if you haven't actually deployed machine learning in production, it's hard to really kind of understand this. And that machine learning is not like traditional software, right? Most IT departments have this frame of reference of traditional software deployment where, just like Ron said, you kind of get it to a level, maybe it's going to have some bugs, but you're expecting sort of a consistent kind of state. It's going to be, you know, something that you, you know, the same kind of data going in, you're going to get the same kind of results coming out. And it's not something that you have to kind of babysit over time. Machine learning is not that way. And in fact, again, this is going to be a bit of a rude awakening because I think, it, you know, it's going to require more investment. Um, it's going to require new positions. In fact, there's a, a new role that I call machine learning assistant um, that, again, it's not going to be taking away jobs. This is going to be a whole new role that's going to become prevalent inside of companies because once you get a model in production, you're going to have to have somebody keeping an eye on it, whether that's validating the results, maybe periodically retraining, periodically deploying new versions of the model. Yeah. Um, and again, this is just not quite what people typically expect with traditional software, right? And they think that, all right, once we got the model trained, now let's just deploy it into production and we're done. And that's not the way it works with machine learning. And so, you know, both of those are, are kind of factors that are, you know, limiting companies' ability to move quickly and will also be, you know, big issues as we move forward over the next few years. Right. Um, I would just offer protect, uh, potentially a machine learning coach. Sounds a little coach. sexier than assistant to okay. a robot. I'm okay. just going to say that. It sounds cool to think I'm coaching it and I'm supervising <laughs> it and I'm making it stronger as opposed to I'm, it's over, you know, it's my overlord. Um, just a thought. 
Uh, I have a zillion other questions, but I think you guys do too, so I don't want to be able to turn it over. We've got this like funky little box that um, we decided we're going to throw around if you guys want to ask a question. So are you guys ready to jump in? Does anybody have a burning question, or should we keep going? I have a question. Sure. Uh, how, how do you all plan to, I guess, commodify what you all offer a company? And I guess what I would be interested in, coming from a background that, I mean, I'm fearful because you all have all the shiny words, do doctors and scientists and lumineers and you know problem like probabilistic that this may work and it's kind of concerning to me because i mean how, how do i incorporate you into my company without being taken advantage of taken advantage of so tell us a little can you tell us who you are and where you're from yeah so i am david archer i work at the hospital of radiologist so machine learning deep learning <coughs> vision is something I'm interested in, and uh, a lot of it's still in the research phase. I'm just wondering how it's going to be planned to be commodified within my industry, uh, and basically as a physician, how to know when someone's a charlatan and when someone's offering me some concrete solution. Right, right. So I need to educate myself. How to do that. Yeah, I have, uh, so I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, so, you know, it's a uh, you know, it, we're in an interesting time, right? So again, my first company, we raised our first round in 2010, and we were using artificial intelligence techniques, but I wouldn't even say the word AI to a potential customer, and definitely not to a journalist, because that would be the f easiest way to just end the conversation, right? So no one wanted to talk about AI in 2010. Now, if you fast forward to 2019, <laughs> Like we have companies approach us and say, hey, you know, my board of directors said we need some sort of machine learning strategy. Uh, can you help us out? Right. And we're like, well, what problem do you want to solve? Like, I don't know. Can you help us figure out a problem to solve? Because right, my board told us that we need to use machine learning. Right. And so we've kind of gone the, the, the full other side of the spectrum in terms of previously people were so scared of it, didn't want to talk about it. Now people are coming out and saying they got to do it just for the sake of doing it. Right. And so I totally get that. And so what I would say is, you know, in, in some cases, this will be thrust upon you, whether you want it or not, whether you can validate it or not, just because it's kind of the hot thing right now, right? And so that probably doesn't make you feel any better. Um, in terms of, you know, charlatans and how do you kind of determine if somebody, you know, is the real deal or not, um, you, you know, fortunately... This is, to me, probably one of the, the one of the nicer aspects of the machine learning and AI community, and it's that it's very open, right? So um, it, it's pretty easy. You know, in fact, there's some companies I know of that they pop up, and now all of a sudden they are touting that they're the the bee's knees when it comes to machine learning. And you look down their their list of of people they have in the company, and none of them have ever published a paper. None of them have, have ever really been seen on the machine learning stage before. And then you can actually, you know, unlike in previous technology eras, you know, there's kind of a backstop on validating whether somebody really is an expert in the field. And that's because it's a very open academic based community, right? So most of the leading pioneers in the machine learning space, virtually all of them came from the academic world, right? And the nice thing about coming from the academic world is they publish papers. That's kind of the, the bar for whether or not you're good or not. And so you can go in and see it's very open, unlike previously where maybe patents were used or just completely proprietary software and somebody could try to sell you something without having shown anything. At least now in the AI space, it's a little more open than it has been traditionally. So I think that's one way. Uh, Ron may have I, I, others. I want Ron to jump in, but yeah. I just, I'm going to reframe the question a little bit because I think that there's something really sensitive in that question, which is when you're dealing with things that are adaptive and are, are shifting or probabilistic, you don't have a clear, definitive, this is right or this is not right moment, mm -hmm. right? You have, you're learning. So as opposed to other software or other solutions where you can test it and say, oh, that didn't deliver what it said it was going to deliver, right? right. You can judge it more effectively. I think that there's really a, a great question there, which is how much do like how much time do I give it? Like how do I know that this is right? <laughs> right. You know that that, that right. sense of feeling assured that yeah. we've made the right choice right. and that we're giving it enough time and that we understand what the parameters are, left or right, about whether or not it's going off the tracks. Um, I think it's a really fair question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I would I would say that. Um, for any machine learning initiative to be successful, you have to have um, the participation of the domain experts. So for example, like in, in radiology, um, it, would be, it would be crazy uh, if anybody came in and said they could uh, build a computer vision model uh, in that space without deep 
uh, partnership with the experts, right? And um, it's not all or nothing either. So it's not like you have to, you know, if you want to explore computer vision and radi radiology for diagnosis or, or, or whatever um, technique you're looking at, it's not like you have to spend uh, just a ton of money and get to the end and it's, it worked or it didn't work. Um, it's a gradual process, actually. Um, and w what we typically do to de-risk these situations, because we don't know on our side, typically, we, when we start working on a project, is the data, is the data sufficient? Do, do the people we're working with understand the space and the problem well enough to help us be s successful for them, right? And so we actually, as a part of all of our engagements, have a prototyping phase. We, we go in, we analyze the data, we do assessment, we try to make sure we understand the domain as much as possible with the domain experts, and then we actually put in little sprints to do uh, research prototyping. And that's where we might look at solving, uh, sticking with this computer vision problem, using a couple of different approaches. And you can find out pretty quickly whether you, the success is on the table. Uh, and the idea is to kind of fast fail. If it's not going to work, let's find out as fast as we can for everybody. Um, so I would, I, would, I, would, um, I would never tell you to you know, uh, be naive about this. There are always going to be companies out there trying to sell you the shiny new thing. But the difference is I, I'm, I'm old enough to have lived through the last AI winter where, honestly, we overpromised and we underdelivered. Now we have superhuman capabilities on a set, do, a set of domain problems that is staggering. Everything from uh, text and computer vision and predictions and uh, self-driving cars, et cetera, where um, th th it's impossible for humans to uh, keep up with the pace of improvement. So I would just say um, engage, be you know, be wary, but you should be able to find out pretty quickly if you're making progress um, to uh, lessen the risk. Thanks. Does that satisfy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it was, no, 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 but it's a big question because I think no, again, it's, I agree. what we're trying to do is create confidence inside organizations. Absolutely. Right? Confidence inside individuals, which gets back to this whole conversation about um, the mindset again or the culture that an organization needs to um, adopt or shift into that allows this kind of process in. Right, which is a more collaborative. Uh, we talk a lot about silos inside organizations, and what a, that's why I'm talking about the TSA example again. I don't know if you ran into that, but um, you know, in other examples where we've talked again about that, you could take a patient from when they're you know in their home and need to have uh, some radiology actually uh, done in their neighborhood, and imagine that that record gets sent to the hospital. So by the time they get from here to there, it'll already be read, and they have to wait in a waiting room, and they have to have you know, time in between. And for that to happen, is three departments that have to coordinate, and they all have different you know. You know, incentives, uh, uh, capacities, resources, uh, et cetera, and they don't like to share, right. right? So that seems to me like, so again, tell us what the organization does. I want to make sure people feel like when you walk into this world, uh, what are the things we need to shift inside how we do what we do? So two big recommendations that we typically give, you know, virtually any client we talk to is, one, centralize your data science resources, and we can get more into that. But then two is, if you really want to em embrace machine learning, um, and again, you know, we, one of my quips is, I think that there's a 10-year backlog of deploying machine learning inside of most enterprises, and that's primarily because there's not enough people that really understand it, and it's just it's going to take, at a minimum, 10 years to work through all this backlog. Um, but in order to really embrace machine learning, you really need more of a data science culture inside of your, your enterprise, right? You have to, there's all these opportunities that are out there, um, but if you don't have the data, you're not going to be able to take advantage of them. And so really what that means is shifting the mindset, um, and, and I'm not a big fan of like the, you know, chief AI officer or trying to, to say that there's only one um, group that is responsible for, you know, kind of a strategy. I think every department needs their own strategy or should really be thinking about how to embrace machine learning um, because it's going to impact every single organization inside your company. And so in order to do that, though, you have to be really be effective and have a good understanding of how to take the data assets that you have and, and prepare them in such a way that they can be used for machine learning. Um, and so that's another, you know, sort of key aspect is, 
There's all the things that low hanging fruit that you could take care of now, but even more than that is kind of preparing for the future. And if you really think through your data strategy, I always say a data strategy needs to come before a machine learning strategy. If you can think through how to really collect and, and start thinking about new data assets that maybe you're just throwing away after six months, I mean, that happens like all the time. Um, you can get your head around that, then you're setting yourself up for really being able to do, you know, all sorts of cool um, applications down the road. Yeah, I would, I would um, um, add to what you said. Um, the idea that you can have data science, like, over here, right, isolated, I, I think is problematic. Um, so just a couple of things. One is, um, even, even prior to sort of this, this wave of machine learning AI, I, I, you guys may have seen this as well. I have seen uh, business analysts or the, you know, the, the data scientist group within companies um, work really hard, develop models, and that they, they essentially go unutilized, right? And that is because I think if you're not integrated into the product flow, then they're viewed as kind of like insights. They're viewed as um, interesting, you know, uh, trivia. Um, and so if you push that out, as you said, push that out into the different groups um, and spread it across, I think you're much, much more likely to see the results of that integrated into the product um, and actually deployed and, and used, right? And the other thing I was gonna say is that the um, historically data science has kind of been backwards facing. It's been sort of more of, uh, you know, uh, analytical looking at trends and trying to think and uh, uh, understand history that's happened. Increasingly, we're seeing it looking forward as predictive, right? Um, being able to do things like make predictions or recommendations on inventory or make predictions about sales. Um, uh, that is a, that's a pretty big change. That's, that's a huge change. And as, um, as it becomes less back looking and more forward looking, um, you're going to see its profile raise, right? It's going to be more and more important that that prediction is correct than if your analysis of the past is correct. Uh, that's thinking about. So good and real quick, I just wanted to, because um, I think especially as it relates to the title of this session about organizational structures, this is an important part. What I said was that I don't think that the AI strategy should be centralized under one group, right? That should be like your chief marketing officer should have their AI strategy and what they're going to do. The IT group should have theirs. You know, everybody should, it should be an aspect of what they do. But I said your data science function should be centralized. What did I mean by that? That's, strict, that's, that's primarily a near-term problem. And so why do I suggest that? So my company, we have, I don't know, 20 data scientists. We had 700 applicants for our data scientist positions last year. That's a lot. And so anytime we'd interview somebody, I'd ask, so why, you know, why are you interested in us? What, what kind of led you to Infinia? You know, we have SAS locally. We're based in Durham, North Carolina. We have Red Hat, IBM, Cisco, all these companies. Why did you come to a smaller company? And inevitably, what I would hear is that, you know, this happened just about every time, is that, well, we looked at your team, and you have this large data science team, and I thought, wow, I could really learn a lot from that team. And so that's different than what most companies have, which is, all right, we're going to stick, we're going to hire one data scientist for the marketing group, and we're going to hire one for um, HR and one over here. And they're, you know, as one of my data scientists says, they're treated more like aliens, right? Like they're the one data scientist over here. And the problem is data science isn't like software development, as I mentioned before, right? It's not been, it's not a, a well understood science at this point. We're still even figuring out what the heck does it mean to be a data scientist, right? I bet a data scientist in your company is different than what it is in my company. And so what that means is if you have a data scientist in HR, they probably look and think differently than the data scientists in marketing. And in fact, it's a hard sell if you open up a new position. Now we're going to do a data scientist in our finance group, and you can come in and be the only data scientist in the finance group. That's a little bit harder than saying, hey, we have this team of 10 data scientists that we pull across the company, and they work on different functions. So I think companies need to centralize their data scientists right now primarily because we're still figuring out what the heck it means to be a data scientist, and it's a much more attractive thing in a world where it's very difficult to hire data scientists. I think long term, we ultimately will treat data scientists like we do software engineers, right? When you hire a software engineer in the HR group and a software engineer in the finance group, they largely look the same. They largely understand by look, I mean, in terms of what they, you know, their practices and what's expected of them. 
Uh, eventually we'll get to that, but we're not there yet with data scientists. And so that's why we recommend trying to centralize that function as much as possible. I, know, I think I was interviewing someone else for this panel at one point, we were chatting about it, and he said, you know, often also there's, again, a culture part to that. So part of it's the learning part. I come from the advertising background. When you put creative people together, it's much stronger than you put creative people and put them with all the business people. Um, they need to be in a place where they're learning because they're constantly innovating yeah. and constantly learning. This stuff is constantly changing and the confidence and the information that gets exchanged is huge. But there's also a sense of like a culture shift between thinking of them as either freaks or magicians, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And so we often think of them as freaks because they're different, even though data scientists sound so you know, precise um, mm -hmm. and they think of themselves as magicians. Right? No, that's right. So, <laughs> I thought that was a great way of framing that we uh, should think about these in terms of humans, not also just in terms of roles, right, yep. and, and how that fits inside an organization. Uh, we've got like seven or eight minutes left. Any other? Second, one question. Yeah. Um, obviously not too off topic, but you both talked about uh, productionizing data science or you know, ML. Mm -hmm. Have you any thoughts around how you implement, implement models into a CI, CD pipeline where you know that it's going to change over time? Do you look at retraining and revalidation as a core component of CICD? And can you just tell me again who you are and where you Sorry, are? my name is Austin Tommy. I'm head of AI for a software company called Kinos from Canada. Thank you. I, I would think so, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, often the hardest part about that is the data. If, like, if you are trying to um, deploy uh, model updates and you're trying to vet them and um, or, or you're trying to do batch prediction or something like that. That's the thing that I think we run into quite frequently that can be challenging is um, uh, making sure that the that sort of that data flow is reliable um, and accessible as a part of the CI, which actually just that alone can be a challenge right there. Um, what is CI? Uh, continuous. continuous integration. So the idea, w what we're talking about is uh, in traditional software, if uh, if you're if you're doing it, you know correctly, you 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 ideally have tests, right? You have some suite of tests at different levels, um, and if you're going to push changes out to production, you'd like to know that those changes haven't broken anything. Well, the the same idea applies here to AI. Well, we're making some changes to the model. Maybe we changed some aspects of the feature engineering or the architecture, or maybe we're getting in new data. And this model is supposed to make predictions about the future. And as we get in new data, we're looking how the landscape has changed. Is the model still making accurate predictions about the future? Um, and I would, I would say 100% that we should take that same philosophy as a, around CI, have tests, have a flow. Um, the challenge there, quite simply though, is that it's hard to know uh, very often whether the model is generalizing well and data has, it hasn't seen. That's, that to me is like the hardest problem, right? Um, and so putting bounds on that process and being able to accurately measure it is, is one of the more challenging parts because you can, you, know, you, can, you can fool yourself into thinking um, everything's working great when, when it's not. Um, we actually, I did the time clock's math wrong. We've got three minutes left. So, oh. Robbie, jump so, in to answer yeah. that. And then yeah. Was, so one thing I would say is a lot of people expect that machine learning is further along in terms of the tooling and, and processes, and they're not. So there's no great answer for, for what you said. I, in fact, this will yeah. be something that comes out over the next five years, I think. This will, there'll be a lot of emphasis around productionalizing machine learning because it's not there today. And in fact, I have a chart where I show, the, if you're familiar with Gartner's hype cycle, machine learning's been at the peak of inflated expectations for the last four years. Um, and then I, I have a chart called Robbie's uh, Technology S-Curve, and it's got machine learning at the very bottom, right? And so there's the hype is off the charts, but the maturity of the fundamental yeah. technologies behind machine learning to solve these problems, they're not there yet. And so a lot of this stuff is going to be figured out over the next few years, and it's just not, you know, there's not a lot of tooling right now to help you get through that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Who you are? Oh, sorry. Uh, Mike Clifton. Uh, when we're just kind of getting started, we've got a couple of machine, uh, machine learning data scientists, and the thing that we're running into is how do you, what's the best way to cost out projects going in? You've got people that are really hungry <laughs> for this. They don't know how, you know, what their data sets really look like, mm -hmm. but getting in and saying, you know, and the prototyping question is, or thought is a good way to start looking at things, but just how you start that, because a lot of the potential is down the road. And right. 
great question. Right. Um, and actually, I think for right. process, if you guys don't mind, if there's two or three questions that you guys want to ask them really quickly, and then y'all can figure out sort of the, there might be some sort of centralized way of answering that. So um, the one is how you cost a project, especially here versus what you think the value or the complexity of it's going to be later on. That's a great question, by the way. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, cool. um, hi. Uh, my name is David. I work for a uh, large PPD. Um, we already have uh, centralized data scientists. And my question is, we're facing a very challenging scenario to maintain and develop this, this, this group because there are startups and tech companies and they are leading and it's hard to maintain. So how can a CPG? That's uh, a whole other question, my friend. That's a whole other panel. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole other panel. So I'm going to hold that one. <laughs> any very other, relevant, though. Any other questions? <laughs> anyone? Bernie? All right, so we'll close with the costing question and then any other advice y'all have as we finish up. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, t I'll take a real quick stab at it and then let you let you go. Um, I think what you have to do is you just have to um, uh, you have to reduce the scope, reduce the scope to the smallest possible win, and then break that. What, what we do is, and we do this all the time, is we we break down three phases. We break it down into sort of discovery, and then prototyping and those two phases you you try to go through as quickly as you can to get to that fast fail and if you go through that phase and, and typically you can do that in uh, four to six weeks right it, you don't it's not a multi-year commitment and at the end of that phase even if you don't know ultimately if you can't peg your success um, with complete certainty, you know whether you're, what the rest of that timeline is going to look like. And you can then, oh. then you can spec that out. Okay, I think you know, it's, we've got two, three months before we could have a proof of concept deployed. Or, no, that's just not going to be possible. We need to, we need to sp hit pause and regroup. And that way, you de-risk it. Because it, it, these are really, really challenging problems. It's not like you can just put a team on this and set some deadline. It's, it's, I say this all the time. It's not like software development in the sense of like you can time box it really well and, and de-risk it. It's much more like research, and you have to take that perspective. But again, the mindset around that, because my work is uh, similar and related, right, which is doing strategic consulting and trying to figure out how to wrap your arms around a problem that we're still trying to define. And there's someone once described that I have an ambiguous process <laughs> that leads to an ambiguous deliverable, which really <laughs> freaks people out, yes. right? And it encouraged me to create a veneer across the top that made it not seem so scary. Uh, but it is hard when you're in something that is constantly evolving or shifting or could take a different shape. So right. I think just, again, adopting a mindset that says that's good if that's how that project comes down, and it's not bad if that's how that project goes down. Yeah, so just to maybe address the, the last question before we run out of time. Yeah, sure. um, so it, regarding how do you keep data scientists, right, in this kind of world of, uh, you know, high demand and, and all of that, you know, my suggestion would be to partner with a startup or partner with uh, a local academic institution um, don't run from it. Don't try to say we are, you know, we're better than all these other companies or maybe taking data scientists. Maybe try to partner with one. Maybe they have somebody that's well known that you can bring in, um, give talks. Again, what you have to do in these types of situations is provide, you know, emphasize what you have available as your strengths, right? And that's your, your, your breadth, maybe your access to universities. You know, can you have, you know, some of the leading researchers come in and give talks, you know, workshops, things like that, things that you could offer um, data scientists maybe, that maybe a startup would have a harder time doing. Um, you have yeah, to really think about how to differentiate. I would say on the CPG side, right, you have this amazing mass opportunity to be able to create a difference. And so yeah. there's something interesting about being able to play at that scale. Emphasize the data. Like, you, get, you guys have so much data that, again, that's, by and large, any company we go into, the, the fundamental problem, and Ron was talking about this too, is getting to the data, right? So using your data as, you know, advertise your data as a reason to come work well, for Well, and there's a big shift happening in the CPG world about who controls that data and how you get to it. So there's something yeah. interesting about the design of the data strategy around that. I was just on a panel the other day talking about the future of retail and the whole idea about how sampling can move in a different way to be able to, so that CPGs can, can actually start to develop the data strategy or a data pool that is actually relevant and interesting to solve a new problem. Uh, for a data scientist. So there's a whole bunch of yeah. complexity that's, well, and that's just, I think it is, is, there's so much interwoven between when you say this and that and the other about how business processes are changing. Uh, we didn't get a chance to hear from our new friend Bali from Al Jazeera, but he uh, was chatting with me right before the thing uh, that said that he's part of a, an initiative inside his media company in which they've brought in some new content strategy and he's had to do transformations, what, seven times, six times? Experience. Six yeah. times in two and a half years. So perhaps <laughs> that Bali is a person who can give us even more expertise next time. Um, I thank you guys all for being here. Thanks for sticking with us. Great, great questions. Thank you so much to Ron and Robbie.
Uh, thanks for having me as part of it. I always learn so much on these panels. I'm like, wait a second, I'm writing down stuff. Uh, so thank you guys so much. This will be recorded. Um, I think Kung Fu AI will put it somewhere. And, um, and carry on. Happy South By. Happy learning. Good job. Good job. Oh my god. Yeah. But you know, I think about that also with my kids because I think about I don't really get them a tutor, I get them a coach. Right? You know your duty to come in and help like either like clarify or level the game or whatever. It just sounds so much more empowering to feel as though you're getting that. Especially when you're talking to machine learning assistant to be an assistant to the machine is like Whoa. Uh, this is our friend Bali, who's been going through the craziness at Al Jazeera. I think, I think so. And then, 